Section 10 of The Visits of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Wells. The Visits of Elizabeth by Eleanor Glenn. Chance Elysee. Chance Elysee. Friday, 26th August. A visit to the dentist. Dearest Mama, you will be surprised to see this address. But Eloise and I are only staying here for the night and go back to Quamere tomorrow. Early this morning she had bad toothache and said she must go to Paris to see her dentist. Godmama and Jean made as much fuss about it as if the poor thing had suggested something quite unheard of. And one could see how she was suffering by the way she kept her handkerchief up to her face. Godmama said she could not accompany her, as she had to pay some important calls, and Jean had promised to be at Saint-Germain to see some horses with the Vicomte, so Eloise suggested I should go with her and that we should stay the night at the appartement in the Champs-Élysées, so that she could have two appointments with Monsieur Adam, the dentist. She has such beautiful teeth. It seems hard that they should ache, and I felt sorry for her. After a lot of talking, it was arranged that we should go up by the eleven o'clock train, and accordingly we started with as much fuss as if we had been departing for a month. We had no sooner got to Paris than Eloise felt better. She left me to go on with the maids and luggage to the Champs-Élysées, while she went to see Monsieur Adam. Paris looked out of seasonish and full of Americans as we drove through. I am sitting in the little salon right now, waiting for her to come in, and I have got awfully tired just looking out of the window. Everything is covered up with brown holland but I dare say it is nice when they are here. The tapestries are beautiful, so is the furniture, judging by the piece I have lifted the coverings from. If she does not come in soon, I shall go for a walk with Agnès. Paris in August. 9 p.m. Héloïse came in just as I was writing this morning, and we had a scrappy kind of déjeuner on the corner of the dining room table. Then she said we had better go to her couturier in the Rue de la Paix. She seemed all right now, and said Monsieur Adam had not hurt her much, and that she was to go to him again tomorrow morning. I always like Paris, even out of the season, don't you, Mama? It is so gay. We had a little Victoria and rushed along, not minding who we ran into, as is always the way with French cabs. When we got to Pekin's, there were nobody but Americans there, and everyone looked tired. Eloise tried on her things, and we went to Caroline's for some hats. They were too lovely, and Eloise gave me a dream. It's an owl lighting on a cornfield, which perhaps is a little incongruous, as they only come out at night, but the effect is good. After that, she said she felt she should like to go and see her confesseur at the Madeleine. And we started there on the chance of finding him. She kept looking at her watch, so I suppose she was afraid he would be gone. We stopped at the bottom of the big steps, and she said if I would not mind waiting a minute, she would go in and see. I always thought one only confessed in the morning, but she seemed so anxious about it that perhaps... If you have anything particular on your mind, you can get it off in the afternoon. It might have been the stories she told about Victorine's liking flowers. I thought she would never come back. She was such a time, quite three quarters of an hour. And it was horrid sitting there, with every creature staring as they passed. Directly after she went in, I caught a glimpse of Antoine in a coupé, going at a great pace, but I could not make him see me before he turned down the street that goes to the back of the Madeleine. I wish he had seen me, for, although I never like him very much, he would have been better than nobody to talk to. 
I believe I should have even been glad to see Lord Valmont. At last I got so cross, what with people staring and the heat and the smells, that I jumped out and went to look for Eloise in the church. She was nowhere to be seen, and I did not like to peer into every box I came to. So at last I was going back to the cab again, when from the end door that leads out into the other street at the back, the Rue Chanche, she came tearing along completely essoufflé. So I suppose there must be some confessing place beyond. She seemed quite cross with me for having come to find her, and said it was not at all proper to walk about a church alone. Which does seem odd, doesn't it, Mamma? As one would have thought, if there was any place really respectable to stroll in, it would have been a church. Church Etiquette I told her how bored I was, and about Antoine passing, and how I had tried to make him see. She seemed more annoyed than ever, and said I must have made some mistake, as Antoine was not in Paris. She was awfully shocked at the idea of my wanting to speak to him in the street anyway, and said I surely must know it was the custom here for the men to bow first. She was altogether so cross and excited and different that I felt sure her confesseur must have given her some disagreeable penance. We went for a drive in the Bois after that, and Eloise recovered and was nice to me. We met the Marquis de Vimandois and a young man walking in one of the side alleys. When I wanted to wave to them, Eloise pinched me and made me look the other way. When I asked why, she said it was not very good form to see people in Paris out of the season, that one never was sure what they were there for and that I was certainly not to mention it either at Tournel or Quamere. Isn't this a queer country, Mama? Morals and Manners We drove until quite late, and just as we were arriving at the door, who should pass but the Marquis? He stopped at once and helped us out. Eloise told him directly that we were only up seeing the dentist, and seemed in a great hurry to get into the porte cochere but he was not to be shaken off and stopped talking to us for about five minutes. He is quite amusing. He looked at me all the time he was talking to Eloise. I am sure, Mama, from what the people at Nazaby talked about, he would have asked us to dine and go to a play if he had been an Englishman, and I told Eloise so. She said no Frenchman would dream of such a thing. Us two alone? It was unheard of and she only hoped no one had seen us talking to him in the street as it was. I said I liked the English way best, as in that case we should be going out and enjoying ourselves, instead of eating a snatchy meal alone. It is now nine o'clock, and all the evening we have had to put up with just sitting on the balcony. It has been dull, and I am off to bed, so good night, dear Mamma. I shan't come up to Paris with French people again in a hurry. Your affectionate daughter, Elizabeth. End of section 10. Recording by J. A. Wells. Section 11 of The Visits of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Visits of Elizabeth by Eleanor Glynn Chateau de Coimar, Part 1 Chateau de Coimar, Monday, 29th of August Dearest Mamma, oh, we had such fun yesterday. After Mass, the Baron sent over to ask if Jean, Eloise and I would go with them to the Foire at La Vanière, a village about ten miles off. It is a very celebrated foire, and in the last century everyone went from Versailles, and even now lots of people who spend the summer there attend. You go in the evening after dinner, and there are no horrid cows and things with horns rushing about, or tipsy people. Godmamma looked awfully severe when she heard of the invitation, but since the row, when they had to cajole me, she has been more civil, so she said I might go if Eloise would really look after me although if I was Victorine she would not have permitted it for a moment. 
we left here about six and then picked up the party at tournelle they all went the old baron and every one except the marquis's mother we dropped the brougham there and went on with them in a huge motor-car that's another fad of the baron's it is lovely motor-carring you get quite used to the noise and smell and you fly along so it takes your breath away even with your hat tied on with a big veil you have rather the feeling you have got to screw up your eyebrows to keep it from blowing away we seem to be no time doing the ten miles the baron and eloise hate it and never go in it except under protest the foire is just one very long street with booths and merry-go-rounds and montagne russe and all sorts of amusing things down each side there are rows of poplar trees behind them and evidently on ordinary occasions it's just the usual french road but with all the lights and people it was gay we stopped at the village inn the toison d'or which is famous for its restaurant and its landlady in the season the duc de cressy's coach comes here from paris every thursday hippolyte was there already he had been sent on to secure a table for us we had no sooner sat down under the awning than the vicomte and antoine and two other officers turned up they had ridden from versailles which is near such extraordinary people sat at some of the tables families of almost peasants at one and then at the next perhaps two or three lovely ladies with very smart dresses and big hats and lots of pearls and some young men in evening dress and then some respectable bourgeois and so on i could hardly pay attention to what the marquis who sat next to me was saying the sight was so new and entertaining the tables had cloths without any starch in them and the longest bread rolls i have ever seen one of the beautiful ladies with the pearls used hers to beat the man next to her before they had finished dinner we did not have fresh forks and knives for everything but the famous dish of the place made up for it it is composed of a poussin oh that is very baby chickens raw oysters and cream and truffles you get a hot bit of chicken into your mouth and think it's all right and then your tongue comes against an iced oyster and the mixture is so exciting you are stimulated all the time and you drink a very fine old burgundy with it which is also a feature of the place i am sure it ought to poison us as oysters aren't in for another month but it is awfully good one of the strange officers is so amusing he looks exactly like the young man the marquise de vermandoise was walking in the bois with but it could not be he as she seemed so surprised to see him at the foire and said they hadn't met for ages the comte sat on my other side he said i would be greatly amused at the booths presently and was i afraid of montagne russe that's only an ordinary switchback mamma so of course i'm not afraid there was cigane playing while we dined and it was all more amusing than anything i have done here yet when we drank our coffee we started down the foire there were hundreds of people of every class but not one drunk or rude or horrid the first entertainment was the chevaux au galop a delightful merry-go-round with the most fiery prancing horses three abreast and all jumping at different moments the marquis helped me up and jean got on the other side we all rode except the comtesse and the old baron it was too lovely you're bounced up and down and you have to hold on so tight and every one screams and the band plays and i wish you could do it mamma i'm sure the thorough shaking would frighten your neuralgia away i could have gone on for an hour but there was such a lot to see we couldn't spare the time for more than one turn the marquis whispered when he helped me off that his walk down the champs elysees had indeed been fortunate as he had seen me and that it was he who was suggested to the baron to come to the foire so of course i felt grateful to him we walked all together more or less but jean kept glued to my side which was rather a bore only the marquis or the vicomte were always at the other side the next place we came to was a huge menagerie of clever animals with their dompteurs cages of lions bears and tigers etc there were sets of seats before the cages where anything interesting was going on and the audience moved up as each new dompteur came into the animals we sat down at first in front of the tiger's cage 
the baron next to me this time the creatures went through astonishing tricks and looked such lazy great beautiful cats the dompteur was a handsome man just the type they always are with a wide receding forehead and flashing eyes they positively blazed at the brutes if they didn't obey him instantly i wonder why all tamers have this shape of head i asked the vicomte but he did not know the bears came next horrid cunning white things and turning in their toes like that does give them such a frumpish look the attraction of the show was to see the great dompteur peson he had been almost eaten by his lions a few months ago and was to make his reappearance accompanied by a beautiful songstress who would charm the beast to sleep peson was just like the other dompteurs only older and fatter and the beautiful lady was such a pet enormously stout in pink satin with quite bare neck and arms the vicomte said that the lions had to be surfeited with food beforehand to keep them from taking their dessert off this tempting morsel she began to sing through her nose about l'amour etc and those lions did look so bored the eldest one simply groaned with ennui his face said as plainly as if he could speak at it again to-night and oh que cela m'embête <laughs> when the song was finished the belle chanteuse stretched herself on two chairs making herself into a sort of bridge for the animals to jump over from our position we could only see mountains of pink satin en bon point and the soles of her feet the lions had the greatest difficulty in jumping not to kick her what a life mamma and then peson put his head right into the old lion's mouth and so ended the performance when we got outside a man was ringing a bell opposite to invite everyone in to see a woman with only a head she could speak he said but had no body the baron insisted upon going in it was a tiny cell of a place and crammed full presently a head appeared on a pedestal and spoke in a subdued voice all the others said it was a fraud but i thought it wonderful antoine wanted to go beyond the barrier and touch it which was mean of him i think presently a villainous-looking old hag who was exhibiting the creature came over and whispered in antoine's ear i only caught saint franc but his face looked interested at once and he and jeanne disappeared behind the curtain and the head disappeared too so we went outside and bought fairings at the next booth there they joined us alors mes amis demanded every one oh, pas la peine très mal fait, said antoine so i suppose it was the machinery they'd been examining the next thing we came to was a sort of swing with flying boats but no one was brave enough to try it except the marquise and me though all the men wanted to come with us you sit opposite one another and they are much higher than the ones in england jeanne would come with me although i wanted the vicomte so i was glad it made him look quite green it chanced that antoine was beside me as we walked the pistol booth so i asked him if he had been in paris on friday and he looked so hard at me you would have thought i was asking a state secret but he said that alas no he'd been detained at versailles so it couldn't have been him after all there must be a lot of french people exactly alike i never keep making these mistakes in england have you ever fired off a pistol mamma it is simply horrid the pistol booth was next after the fairings shop and the prizes were china monsters and lanterns etc the comtesse is a splendid shot and hit the flying ball almost each time she is such a quiet little thing one would not expect it of her the baronne made a lot of fuss and said she knew it would kill her until hippolyte who was behind the party with her cloak said madame la baronne doit essayer c'est nécessaire que toutes les belles jeunes dames sachent comment se défendre and she fired off the pistol at last with her eyes shut and it was a mercy it didn't kill the attendant the ball lodged in the wall just beside him so we thought we'd better leave after that next came the montagne russe oh how i love a switchback mamma if i were the queen i would have a private one for myself and my particular friends around windsor castle i could go on all day 
the marquis and the vicomte kept so close to me that jean could not take the seat beside me as i saw he intended to and then the other two made quite a shuffle but the vicomte won the person who sits next to you is obliged to hold your arm to prevent you tumbling out i looked round to see and every one was having her arm held but i don't believe the vicomte need have gripped mine quite so tight as he did we had three turns next time the marquis was beside me and he was more violent than the vicomte so when it came to the last and jean scrambled in and began to hold tighter than either of the others i just said my arm would be black and blue and i would rather chance the danger of falling out in a seat by myself than put up with it that made him sit up quite straight i can't see why people want to pinch one can you mamma i call it vulgar and i'm sure no englishman would do it it seems that frenchmen are awfully respectful and full of ceremony and politeness and then every now and then directly they get the opportunity they do these horrid little tricks the next entertainment was really very curious it was a marble woman down to her waist and as you looked the marble turned into flesh her eyes opened and she spoke then her colour faded and she turned into marble again and was handed round the audience wasn't it wonderful mamma i can't think how it was done and as antoine and jeanne did not go behind the curtain to examine the machinery i suppose we shall never know after that there were endless shows performing dogs fortune-telling and circuses etc but the nicest of all was another merry-go-round with seats which went up and down like a boat in a very rough sea hardly one of them would venture but i made the vicomte come with me for two turns he looked so pale at the end of it and when i wanted to go a third time he said we must be getting on and no one else offered to come wasn't it stupid of them as it was by far the most exciting part of the foire it was half past twelve before we got back to the toison d'or and there had supper with punch a l'americaine oh it is good and you do feel so gay after it one of the ladies with the pearls who was also supping was so friendly with the man next to her the peasant was of their party and he did look common in clothes while he was quite handsome in spangled tights we were obliged to go slowly in the motor-car returning there were such heaps of people and carts and things on the road but we got back to Quamar about two and i have slept so late this morning so now good-bye dear mamma your affectionate daughter elizabeth chateau de Quamar, wednesday august thirty first dearest mamma to-day is the dinner and cotillion at the de tonnelles the marquis and the vicomte and antoine and every one will be there and i'm sure it will be fun the vicomte can't get leave for the night so the baron who was here yesterday on her bicycle told us he will have to ride back to versailles as there are no trains at that time to be there for some duty at six in the morning i can't tell you how many miles it is he will be tired poor thing these last two days have been just alike that's why i've not written the same tiresome ceremony about everything and the same ghastly evenings we went for a drive on monday and godmamma did nothing but question me as to what we had done every minute of the time we were in paris this is the first chance she has had with me alone so i would not tell her a scrap even a simple thing like eloise going to the madeleine oh she thinks i'm fearfully stupid i can see i forgot to tell you about the morning we left paris eloise went to see adam again and i went shopping with agnes but i would not even tell godmamma that victorine says spiteful things to me whenever she can but jean and eloise are so charming that i don't mind the rest we are to wear sort of garden party dresses and hats at the entertainment to-night dinner is to be at eight in a large pavilion where they have a beautiful parquet floor laid down and then when the tables are cleared away we shall begin the cotillion as i have never danced in one before i hope i shan't make an idiot of myself 
this morning i very nearly had another row with godmamma you will never guess what for mamma she knocked at the door of my room before i was quite dressed and then came in with a face as glum as a church she began at once she said that she had heard something about me that she hoped was a mistake so she thought it better to ask me herself she understood that i went down to the salle de bain every day instead of just washing in my room i have done so ever since agnes discovered there really was water enough for a decent bath there and that no one else seemed to use it i began to wonder if she was going to accuse me of tampering with the taps but not a bit of it after a rigmarole as if she thought it almost too shocking to mention she said she understood from her maid who had heard it from the valet de chambre who clears out the bath after i leave that there were never any wet chemises and that she was therefore forced to conclude that i got into my tub tout nu i had been so worked up for something dreadful that i'm sorry to say mamma i went into a shriek of laughter that seemed to annoy godmamma very much she got as red as a turkey cock and said she saw nothing to cause mirth in fact she had hoped i should have been ashamed at such deplorable immodesty if as she feared from my attitude her accusation was correct i said when i could stop laughing of course it was correct how in the world else should one get into a bath her eyes almost turned up into her head with horror she could only gasp mais si quelqu'un ouvrait la porte mais je le ferme toujours à clef i said and then i asked her if in france they also dried themselves in their wet chemises but she said that that was a childish question as i must know it would be an impossibility and when i said i could not see any difference in washing or drying she was so stunned she was obliged to sit down and fan herself i smoothed her down by assuring her it was the english custom and that i was sorry i shocked her so at last i got rid of her evidently thinking our nation brule as well as toque <laughs> now aren't they too odd mamma i suppose a nice big bath is such a rare thing for them that they're obliged to make as much fuss as possible over it one would think that they received company there dressing up like that heloise and the smart people wash all right it's only the girls and the thoroughly goody ones like godmamma who are afraid of water the marquis came over from tournelle with a note from the baronne after dejeuner to-day i happened to be getting some music out of the big salon for eloise when he arrived louis the valet who showed him in did not catch sight of me as i was behind the piano or he would certainly have taken him somewhere else he began at once after putting his heels together to say a lot of compliments and things this was a fortunate chance more than he dared to hope would i promise to dance the cotillion with him to-night etc etc you would not believe mamma the amount he got into the five minutes before eloise came into the room she knew it was her own fault for sending for the music that i was alone with him or i should have got a scolding as it was she talked without ceasing until at last he got up to go i had not answered about the cotillion so as i have half promised the vicomte i don't know which i shall take perhaps i could manage both as i believe one only has to sit on a chair and every now and then get up and dance however i'll see when i get there now good-bye dear mamma your affectionate daughter elizabeth a chateau de Quamar, september first dearest mamma i have had a proposal <gasps> isn't it too interesting it all happened at the de tournelles last night but i never blushed or did any of the things they used to in miss edgeworth's novels that you have allowed me to read but i must go straight on we were quite punctual at chateau de tournelles and got there as the clock struck eight eloise looked perfectly lovely she does hold herself and walk so beautifully and her head is such a nice shape i am going to be like her and not like the women at naseby who all slouched when i am married victorine looked better than usual too and eloise had put some powder on her face for her but afterwards it came off in patches and made her look piebald 
however to start she was all right and everybody was in a good temper there were lots of people there already and the baron and the comtesse received us in the hall i wore the white silk and my pink tulle hat the marquis and the vicomte both flew across when we arrived and the vicomte got to me first as godmamma detained the marquis and this is where frenchmen shine for although he told me afterwards that he wanted to murder her he stood with a beautiful grin on his face all the time the vicomte at once began to assure me i had promised him the cotillion but i would not say and as he could only get words in edgeways with victorine listening all the time it made it rather difficult for him then the comte and rene his little boy came round with a silver basket full of buttonholes and little cards with names and by the kind of flower we got we were to know which table we were to sit at as they were to be decorated with the same of course the baron had arranged for the vicomte to take me in and our table was pink and white carnations presently the whole company had arrived and we started a huge train two and two arm in arm for the pavilion it was pretty all the trees hung with electric lights and chinese lanterns and the pavilion itself a fairyland of flowers there were about twelve tables three of different coloured carnations for the jeune fille and the rest with roses for the married people godmamma thought it most imprudent separating them like that and would hardly let victorine sit down so far away from her until she saw the daughter of the princesse d'autorine at the same table victorine went in with another officer from versailles in the same regiment of chasseurs as the vicomte he was like a small black monkey the marquis sat with the comtesse at her table and godmamma and the other bores had a table with the old baron etc the baron had quite a young man next to her i expect she could not do with the chaperones and the old gentleman most of the girls at our table were either ill at ease or excited at the unusual pleasure of being without their mothers and at first no one talked much the french country people are almost as frumpy as the english only in a different way but many of the guests were very smart and of course had come from paris the vicomte did say such a lot of agreeable things to me and the others were so occupied with their one chance of talking to a young man that they did not listen as much as usual he said he had never spent such an agitated night as the one at vernon so i said no the fleas were horrid he said he had not meant them he meant that the sight of my beautiful hair hanging down had caused him une grande émotion and rêve délicieuse there was an oldish girl next to him whom he knew she has quaffed saint catherine for several years now and was put at our table i believe to be a kind of chaperone she happened to be listening just then as her partner would talk to victorine's friend the pretty one with the dirty nails who was at his other side she caught the word fleas and at once asked what we were talking about un sujet si désagréable she said i said it was about our journey on the sauterelle where at vernon m de la tremor had been so badly bitten by the fleas that they had given him silly dreams <laughs> he said his dreams were as beautiful as those produced by the hachis of monte cristo whatever that is so the old girl exclaimed quel pouvoir pour une puce she thought we were mad and i overheard her presently telling her partner when she could get him to listen that no one would believe the bizarre conversations of the toquet english unless they actually heard them i would not say i would dance the cotillion with the vicomte i told him i had half promised it to the marquis and when he seemed offended i said if he was going to be disagreeable i would certainly dance it with m de beaupre the marquis's name which i forgot to tell you before i remember hearing octavia say once that it never did to make oneself easy to young men that the more capricious one was the better and you know how nice octavia is and i meant to be like her he went on imploring so i told him that i had come there to enjoy myself not to amuse him 
so i should just dance with whom i pleased or not at all if i happened not to want to he said i was très cruel and looked perfectly wobbly-eyed at me but i did not mind a bit as dinner went on all the girls began to talk and get excited and laugh and every one was so gay but i could see godmamma craning her neck with anxiety and disapproval and i am sure if it had not been for the princesse d'autorine being at her table she would have jumped up and clawed victorine away it came to an end at last and we returned arm in arm to the house while the servants arranged the pavilion for the cotillion godmamma collected victorine and me and made us stay by her and that horrid old madame de visac the one who called me a jeune femme came up and they had a conversation godmamma said it was très imprudent having the dinner first that the champagne would go to the young men's heads and with all the care in the world no one could foresee the consequences the garden too if they should dance the farandole what opportunities it was all the fault of the chère baronne so sadly giddy for her age she never thought of the anxieties of other mothers having married her only daughter so young i don't know what godmamma feared but i should hate to think you could not trust me to behave like a lady mamma if i was out of your sight a moment i saw the marquis talking to a very young youth he seemed pleading with him about something and presently the youth crossed over and kissed godmamma's hand and then asked victorine for the cotillion she looked furious but she was obliged to say yes as no one else had asked her it was getting late and the marquis was busy speaking to some other ladies and presently he came up to us and the young youth said before he could speak n'ai je pas de la veine mon cher mademoiselle de coimard m'a promis le cotillon upon which the marquis asked me to dance it with him right out loud before godmamma and when i said i had half promised it to monsieur de la tremore he looked so cross and offended that i thought it was better to be firm with him as i had been with the vicomte he the vicomte came up just then and they looked as if they wanted to fight each other so i said if they would stop frowning i would dance it with both of them but if they were nasty i should not dance it with either and so that is how it ended i was to have one on each side godmamma said to me that it was unheard-of conduct and might have produced a duel and when i tried to explain to her that that was just what i had avoided she looked angrier than ever and would not understand wasn't it stupid of her mamma at last we got to the pavilion and all sat around and having both the vicomte and the marquis to talk to i did have fun they arranged that our chairs should be against the wall and not in the row that the chaperones were behind godmamma tried to make signs to me to come and sit by victorine in front of her but i pretended not to see until all the chairs were filled up the marquise de vermandoise was next me with the vicomte between she was dancing with the comte oh, we were gay the first set of presents were big brocade bags and we called one our pot au feu and pretended that it was for the ingredients to make bon menage and so all the presents that were small enough afterwards we put in there to keep for me i did have lots a cotillion is very easy mamma as you have often told me and it was fun dancing with all sorts of strange people that one did not even know in one figure a huge russian prince got hold of me and squeezed me until i very nearly screamed you see mamma how dreadful foreigners are like that it was like being hugged by a bear in the zoo and after it he kept giving me flowers or presents if i dared to sit down for a moment but he did not say a word except once or twice a mumble of adorable mademoiselle <laughs> my two partners were nice we had a perfectly beautiful time they laughed at everything i said and madame de vermandoise leant over and whispered while they were both away doing a figure that never had any one had such a success as me and that all the old ladies would be ready to tear my eyes out heloise did not dance with antoine but he sat next to her and they talked while his partner was away with other people 
it is much better to have two partners mamma because then one is not left to oneself at all and they are each trying to be nicer than the other all the time the comtesse led the cotillion with a cousin of hers he does do it well and does nothing else in paris the baron told me at last we got towards the end and they began the farandole you know it mamma a lady and a gentleman take hands and then she beckons someone and he has to come and then he calls another lady and so on it goes on until the whole company are hand in hand and the leader runs about everywhere with this chain of people after him dancing a long sliding step to such a lovely go-ahead tune the leader tears all over the garden and one is obliged to follow in and out it is too exciting and just as we got to the furthest end of the illuminated paths and had rushed around into the dark someone let go and in the confusion of trying to catch on again the marquis and i were left behind it was then the proposal happened he did not wait a moment he talked so fast i could hardly understand him he said he had heard that it was a custom of our country to speak directly to the person one loved without consulting the parents so he hoped i would believe he meant me no disrespect but that he adored me he had fallen in love at first sight when he went to review victorine that he implored me to fly with him as his mother would never consent to his marrying an englishwoman oh think of it mamma me flying with the marquis without a wedding cake or bridesmaids or pages or trousseau or any of the really nice bits of getting married only the boring part of just going away and staying with one man without any of the other things to make up for it i nearly laughed at the ridiculousness of it only he was so deadly in earnest and would hold my hand i said i could not think of such a thing and would he take me back to the pavilion he became quite wild then and said he would kill himself with grief and such a lot of things about love but i was so wanting to join in the farandole again we heard them coming nearer that my attention was all on that and i didn't listen much anyway i am sure runaway matches aren't legal in france from what i heard jean saying two nights ago at dinner and i told him so at last and that pulled him up short and just then the train passed and i stretched out my hand to the last man and was whirled away back to the pavilion and the people i was glad to get away from the marquis because he looked desperate and you can't trust foreigners they have pistols and things in their pockets and he might have shot me when we got back to our seats the defilier began and i took the vicomte's arm to go and make our curtsy to the comtesse and the baron it was just as well the marquis was away because they might have quarrelled as to which one's arm i was to take just before the supper tables were brought in m de beaupre turned up again his face was green he came up behind me and whispered through his teeth that i had broken his heart and that he should marry victorine so you see mamma nothing could have turned out better and they ought to be very grateful to me we had the gayest supper all at little tables and it was arranged that we should go with the de tournelle and the baron to a rally de papier to-day given by the seventy-fifth cuirassier at the forêt de mali while we were going to the house to get our wraps i overheard two ladies talking of godmamma they said she gave herself great airs and considering that every one knew that years ago she had been the ami of that good-looking englishman at the embassy these high stilts of virtue were ridiculous i suppose to be an ami is something wicked in french but it doesn't sound very bad does it mamma and whatever it is i wonder if poor papa knew as he was at the embassy and it might have been one of his friends mightn't it i expect she had not a moustache then i am dreadfully afraid that the vicomte won't be able to be at the rally to-day although he did whisper when he was putting on my cloak that nothing should keep him away and that then i would believe the extent of his devotion he won't have gone to bed at all if he does turn up as he will only have got back to versailles just in time for his duty at six and how he is to be in the forêt de mali by ten i don't know but we shall see it is just time to start the break is at the door so good-bye dear mamma with love from your affectionate daughter elizabeth End of section 11
Section twelve of the Visits of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Visits of Elizabeth by Eleanor Glynn. Chateau de Coimar, Part two. Chateau de Coimar, Thursday night, September first. Dearest Mamma, I wonder if you have ever been to a Rallye de Papier it is fun we got to marley at last after a long drive the rendezvous was in the middle of the forest in such a lovely glade and although it rained for the last twenty minutes of our drive the sun came out when we got there and the lights through the trees on the wet green were so beautiful there were quantities of carriages already arrived every sort victorias coaches pony carts charabancs motor cars and a few of the really odd kinds of chandridans that one sees coming to country garden parties in england there were also numbers of officers riding in uniform cuirassiers chasseurs dragons and they were to take part in the chase there was one officer who was to lead the carriages in a procession through the short cuts so that we might not miss any of the jumps and he had a horn slung over his shoulder i do think it's such a sensible plan and if we could have the foxes trained in england to go just where they should and then always drive to where the jumps are like that how much nicer hunting would be wouldn't it mamma well at last every one seemed to be arrived and it was gay i was glad godmamma had been too tired to come so victorine was actually trusted with jean and eloise and me we had picked up the baronne and comte and the marquise de vermandoise at tournelle on our way the brake was not quite like an english one it had seats facing and then an extra one behind for the grooms and jean drove with eloise beside him but he does look like a trussed pigeon and if the horses were not as quiet as mice i am sure the baronne would never have trusted herself with him they all began to chaff about the vicomte il ne chevauchera jamais si loin pas même pour vos beaux yeux the marquise said victorine seemed annoyed that any one should expect he would do anything for me effidement monsieur de la tremor ne viendra pas she said i saw a beautiful black horse being led about by a groom apart from the crowd and i wondered who would ride it just before the horn sounded for the carriages to start from the farthest end of the alley we saw an officer galloping as hard as he could mon dieu c'est gaston screamed the baron c'est pour vous enchanteresse said the comte que c'est ridicule snapped victorine while the marquise laughed and put her tongue into her gap oh la belle jeunesse she said meanwhile the vicomte had dismounted jumped on to the fresh black horse and was bowing beside us vous voyez je suis venu he said and he looked only at me i don't know why mamma but i felt the blood rushing all over my cheeks it was nice of him wasn't it he had arranged it all yesterday and by changing horses and galloping the whole way he had managed just to get to the rendezvous in time i don't believe any englishman that i know would do so much for me and i was touched we were fortunate in being almost the first carriage behind our leader the officer with the horn and he took us across roads and we halted at last where we could see the whole hunt advancing to some hurdles which had been erected at a few yards distance from each other down the alley oh such an excitement every one encouraging them at the top of their voices their uniforms glittering in the sun the jumps were not very high and most of the officers got over all right only one cuirassier fell and every one shrieked but he wasn't a bit hurt we clapped those who jumped especially well and cried bravo it was fun and then when they'd all passed we were conducted through some more short cuts to another set of hurdles covered with green boughs and these were a little higher it did sound lively with horns blowing and people shouting all the time the vicomte was among the last as he passed us following the paper but he waved gaily we had to drive very quickly to be on time for the next obstacle and so it went on when we watched the last ones the vicomte was among the very front four 
then the exciting part began as they had to race for the ribbons white for the winner and blue for the second but it was quite a long way so we had time to get to the winning post the flat place near where the chateau stood formerly there were long tables laid out with goute and the bands of the regiments playing nice tunes victorine began to be disagreeable directly we saw them coming the vicomte well to the front quand c'est cruel de monsieur de la tremore de presser son cheval à ce point she said while even the comte became excited and shouted bravo gaston i was pleased when he came in first and really he rides quite nicely mamma then every one got out of the carriages and there was a ceremony the wife of the colonel of the seventy-fifth chasseurs young and nice-looking placed a white ribbon with gold fringe ends round the neck of the vicomte while he knelt and kissed her hand on the damp grass and when he got up there was quite a wet stain on his knees the second man a great lumbering cuirassier got a blue ribbon and as he was heavier the stain showed worse on his red trousers after that we all began to eat cakes and drink drinks i don't know what they were made of that's why i say drinks anyway they were sweet and nice and as the rain had stopped we danced on the green after we had finished now you know mamma we could never have any fun like this in england what englishman would think of dancing the lancers on sopping grass quite gravely with a white ribbon round his neck like a pet lamb and his trousers wet through at the knees they would simply laugh in the middle and spoil the whole thing the vicomte danced with me of course and while we were advancing to our vis-a-vis -vis in the first figure he managed to whisper that he adored me and now that he had ridden all night and won the white ribbon for me i ought to believe him i did not answer because there was not time just then and he looked so reproachfully at me for the rest of the lancers it began to rain again before we finished and we got into the break as quickly as we could it was a perfect wonder that they were not all exclaiming at their wet feet and catching cold but it seems that dancing on the green and these sort of fetes champetres are national sports and you don't catch cold at them it is only washing and having the windows open and the house aired and things like that that give cold in france the vicomte came back with us and as he was one too many for the break we had to sit very close on our seat he was between the baron and victorine who made room for him when he was just going to sit down by me she kept giggling all the way home and the vicomte looked so squashed and uncomfortable i was next beyond the baron and as both of them could not keep up their umbrellas victorine was obliged to put down hers and the drips from the baron's umbrella got on to the roses in victorine's hat at last they ran in a red stream right down her nose and she did look odd and each time she said anything to the vicomte he nearly had a fit to keep from laughing when we got back and she found how she was looking she was cross the vicomte took hold of my hand when he helped me out it wasn't in saying good-bye as of course unmarried people only bow and don't shake hands somehow his spur caught in my dress and we had to stop a minute to disentangle it the others had bolted into the house as they were afraid of the rain so we were alone for an instant the vicomte at once kissed my hand and said je vous adore it was done so quickly that even hippolyte who had come out with an open umbrella to help us did not see at least i hope he didn't we went into tournelle to have something to drink while the horses were being rubbed down as we had had such a long drive and it was at the first mirror victorine discovered her red striped nose while i was sipping my punch i heard the baron telling heloise that her nephew the marquis had consented to marry victorine and that the baron would go over to croixmare the next day to make the formal demand for her hand then she whispered something and they looked at me and heloise laughed while the baron said oh, pauvre garçon c'est dommage qu'il ne puisse pas combiner le plaisir avec les affaires and when we got back to croixmare heloise came to my room and kissed me and thanked me 
she had heard she said from the baron how i had broken the marquis's heart and so got him to consent to take victorine i am glad mamma that getting married is differently arranged with us i should hate to have some one because somebody else that he wanted would not have him however victorine is as pleased as can be and has been smiling to herself all the evening now i must go to bed so good-bye dear mamma with love from your affectionate daughter elizabeth chateau de coimard saturday september third dearest mamma i am sure what i am going to tell you will surprise you quite as much as it has done me victorine is really engaged the day after the rallye de papier it rained again and as we were sitting in the little salon after breakfast the old baron was announced he was dressed in a frock coat and a tall hat just as if it was paris and the height of the season they made conversation for about ten minutes and then he got up and putting his heels together he said he had come to request a private interview with madame la comtesse douairiere de coimard and monsieur le comte de coimard son fils upon which victorine looked coy and began scrabbling with her toes on the parquet eloise was not in the room and godmamma said to me that it was time for our walk as the rain had stopped and mademoiselle blanc the tug would be waiting so we bundled out of the room and victorine for the first time became affectionate as we went upstairs il est venu pour demander maman pour son neveu monsieur de beaupre she said putting her arm round my waist j'espère que cela ne vous chagrin pas chérie and when i asked her why in the world it should grieve me she said that as every one had noticed how i had flirted with the marquis she supposed his preferring another girl could not be quite pleasant i could have screamed with laughter if i hadn't been so angry i felt dreadfully tempted to tell her of the marquis's proposal to me and why he was marrying her only that would have been playing down to her level of meanness so i said that the english idea of flirting and the french were different that the marquis seemed to me to be quite an agreeable frenchman and no doubt she would be very happy and far from it grieving me i was delighted to think that she would be settled at last as twenty-two was rather on the road to fixing st catherine's tresses she dragged her arm away in such a hurry that she scratched her hand on a pin that agnes had stupidly left in my belt voyez vous avez fait sonner maman she said almost crying with fury all i said was qui si fort si pique and as we had got to the door of my room i went off in fits of laughter she looked so like a cross monkey i couldn't help it well you can think mamma we did not have an agreeable walk victorine talked in her most prudish goody style to the remorqueur and never addressed me while poor mademoiselle blanc was so nervous trying to speak to both as we got to the turn into vinon monsieur dubois victorine's music-master came up the street he is a rather vulgar-looking person with a black moustache and lemon-yellow gloves and horrid if you have to be quite close to him just then we stopped to give some sous to a beggar-woman so as he passed he said with a great flourish of the hat was he to come on saturday as usual for the lesson victorine looked down all the time modestly and the tug answered oh of course so he said it would be a never to be sufficiently thanked kindness if mademoiselle would take back with her this roll of music that he had been on his way to deliver chez elle as it was much out of his road and he was pressed for time at his next lesson victorine at once seized it and he bowed again and walked on mademoiselle blanc had already a parcel in each hand she was taking to the embroidery shop after that victorine was a distrait and seemed in a great hurry to get home she even spoke to me and while the tug was looking at wools in the shop she fidgeted so with the music that it came undone i offered to carry it as i had no parcels but she snatched it up as if it was gold and in doing so a bit of paper fell out of it 
and as i picked it up i could not help seeing that it began ma cruelle adorée she said in a great rage that it was only the words of a song as she put it in her pocket so i don't see why she should have been so furious with me seeing it do you mamma but she had not got over the pin in my belt i suppose anyway she made us trot home with seven-leagued boots godmamma met us in the hall radiant and clasping victorine to her breast said she must announce to her the joyful news that m le baron de fremond had made the demand on the part of his sister the marquise de beaupre for the hand of her peerless victorine for her son and his nephew the marquis de beaupre and that she godmamma had consented to relinquish to them this treasure jean came out of the smoking-room just then and they all began kissing oh it was awful i got upstairs as quickly as i could and eloise soon joined me there she was enchanted at the idea of really getting rid of victorine and she said godmamma's rheumatism was growing so bad she would soon have to spend the summer at german baths and so they would fortunately at last have quamar to themselves and she could not thank me enough for having assisted at this denouement all the evening victorine played the tunes the music-master gave her and once or twice broke into a song of joy but when i asked her to try the one beginning ma cruelle adorée she looked green and said she was tired and would go to bed then jean and i had a game of billiards we often do now after dinner the salle de billiard opens out of the salon and there is a glass like a window over the mantelpiece so that you can see into the two rooms from each other it always reminds me of alice in through the looking-glass you expect to find a mirror and you see into another room godmamma generally accompanies us into the billiard-room and sits bolt upright in an armchair watching us but to-night she was too excited to pay us so much attention and stayed talking to eloise about the engagement jean seemed nervous and sad and knocked about the balls aimlessly not trying a bit it is only french billiards but still one has to play properly so at last i said that evidently the good news of victorine's engagement had so distracted him that he could not pay attention to the game he seemed quite startled ma foi le jeu he said vacantly i put down my cue and asked him quite gently what was the matter just then the bangle you gave me last christmas came undone so jean put his cue down too and offered to fasten it oh it is difficult to do oneself so i thanked him and handed him my wrist his hands trembled so he could not do it i thought he was ill and bent over him to see fortunately at that moment we happened to be at the one part of the table which can't be seen from the other room because jean behaved so queerly i feel sure godmamma would have been horrified he did not worry about the bangle but just began kissing my hand simply dozens of kisses i pulled and pulled to try and get it away but he would not let go and kept murmuring that at last at last he was alone with me oh now wasn't it too annoying mamma i could not call out or make a fuss because there would have been such a scene and you would never think a frenchman could be so strong for although i wrenched and dragged i could not get my hand away and it was making me crosser and crosser every minute at last when he began to kiss my wrist it tickled so i was afraid i should laugh and then he would think i was not serious so i seized my cue with the other hand and just told jean in a firm voice that if he did not let go that instant i would break it over his head that stopped him he pulled himself together and said oh pardon pardon and that he was awfully sorry and that it was because i was going away soon and he was mad and that is what i believe it was mamma a fit of some kind did you ever hear there was anything odd in the Quama family anyway it shows foreigners are not to be trusted for even if they haven't pistols ready to shoot you they are doing something queer like this presently he took up his cue and began playing again and a louise came in from the salon she noticed he looked different and said at once qu'avez-vous mon ami 
une mauvaise digestion replied jean and he went up and drank sirop at the side table i think i should perhaps tell eloise what it really was and warn her to keep an eye on him oh, but then it might worry her and he may not have another attack for a long time no one would suspect him of being cracked he looks as quiet and respectable as the pony that mows the lawn ah the post is starting and i must go to breakfast so now good-bye with love from your affectionate daughter elizabeth p s the day after to-morrow there is to be a dinner-party here for the fiancés to meet all the tournell party and his mother and a couple of cousins will be here besides the vicomte and antoine and the marquise who are staying at tournell end of section twelve section thirteen of the visits of elizabeth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the visits of elizabeth by eleanor glynn chateau de Quamar, part three chateau de Quamar, tuesday september sixth dearest mamma the dinner for the fiances came off last night it was the first time we have had real evening dresses on since i was here i wore the pink silk and eloise was delighted with it she says you could not possibly improve upon the style you dress me in it is ideal for a young girl the day after jean behaved so queerly he was not at breakfast he went to paris and i did not see him until the evening when he was as stolid and quiet as usual so it must have been a fit and perhaps he went to paris to see his doctor victorine had her music lesson and i don't know what could have upset her but the tug who always sits in the room with her came flying out saying victorine was faint and she must get her a glass of water so i ran into the salle d'etudes to see if i could help her there she was flopping on the music stool with m dubois kneeling by her looking cross and reproachful and just like the villain in the pantomimes i heard her say cela doit être complètement oublié entre nous à présent que je vais être marquise i don't know what it was about but if she was telling him that she would not be friendly with him any more i do call it snobbish don't you mamma just because she's going to be a marquise it isn't as if he was an english marquis even like lord valmond that would be of some importance but a trumpery french title without any land or money oh it is ridiculous of course here no one has his own land really since the revolution i mean like tournel they only call the new house that i believe the real tournel is down in touraine somewhere and belongs to some one else now this is chateau de Quamar, but then jean's great-grandfather bought it back again now i've wandered from what i was telling you oh yes about victorine and monsieur de bois he got up from his knees when he saw me and began fanning her while she flopped more than ever but i don't think she felt very faint her face was so red and when the tug returned with the water i came away as they both looked as if they wanted to murder me the excitement had made m dubois's collar quite give way and he looked a dirtier and more pitiable object than usual such an affair the dîner de fiancailles victorine wore a pink dress too with horrid bunches of daisies on her shoulders and in her hair and as that is dark and greasy and dragged off her face and done in the tightest twist at the top it does not look a suitable place for daisies to be sprouting from i hate things in the hair anyway don't you mamma however she was delighted with herself so it was all right we waited in the big salon standing behind godmamma to receive the company first arrived the old baron and the baronne and the marquis and his mother the marquis kissed victorine's hand as well as godmamma's and eloise's and you should have seen her bridling when he got to me he made the stiffest bow and just then the comte and comtesse de tournelle the marquise de vermandoise and the vicomte were announced and immediately following antoine and two cousins of godmamma's 
to finish the party there were a batch of the marquis's relations who had come specially from paris we were spared yolande and marie who usually sit up to dinner with their german bonne and eat everything that they shouldn't and then scream in the night there was a buzz of conversation and the vicomte talked to me but i could not help hearing what the marquis said to victorine vous aimez la bicyclette mademoiselle oh, oui monsieur moi j'aime mieux l'automobile oh, mais il y a toujours de la poussière and they're going to be married in a month the vicomte kept bending over me and looking silly and the marquis fidgeted so that he could not go on talking to victorine one eye was always fixed on us that seemed to please the vicomte for he got more and more embrassé and i could not help laughing in return at dinner he took in madame de vermandoise but sat next to me and on my other hand was one of the cousins a harmless idiot too timid to speak much and with all kinds of horrid baby flux growing on his face if men are to wear beards which i should forbid if i were the queen they ought to be shut up until they are really grown opposite to us were victorine and the marquis and godmamma and the baron and jean and the marquis's mother oh they did look a dull lot and the marquis's mother eats worst of all we had the greatest fun at our side madame de vermandoise was delicious with gaiety the comte was on her other hand and we four never stopped joking and laughing the whole of dinner it was such a big party so the conversation could not be quite as general as usual the marquis got gloomier and gloomier as time went on i could not look up that i did not find his angry eyes fixed on me even victorine's aggressive joy at having caught him was damped when she could not get him to pay attention to what she was saying at last when he was straining his ears to try and hear my conversation with the vicomte she got absolutely exasperated with him and addressed a question to him in a loud sharp voice it made him jump so that he bounced round in his seat and as she had lowered her head to put a piece of the becazine which had been poised on her fork while she spoke into her mouth his jumping round and her raising her head suddenly made her daisies catch on his beard oh and you never saw such a funny sight mamma it was a nasty little wired dewdrop that got fixed in poor monsieur de beaupre's fur and there they were she still grasping her fork and he looking ready to eat her with annoyance their two heads were fastened together and there they would have remained only hippolyte who always goes everywhere with the baron came to the rescue and untangled them Oh, but it hurt the marquis very much as some of the hairs had to be pulled out and it did not mend matters hippolyte muttering cela doit être que monsieur le marquis doit faire plus attention à l'affaire qu'il a en main s'il désire garder ses cheveux intacts the affair made quite a commotion at the table and victorine so nearly cried with rage that the marquis's mother had to give her smelling salts madame de vermandoise was overcome with laughter and her tongue was hardly ever out of her gap while the marquis sat white with fury when we left the table arm in arm things cleared up and while we were alone when the men went back to smoke victorine was made to play something and she really plays very well it was so stiflingly hot that at last some one the comtesse i believe asked to have the windows opened on to the terrace there was a fair-sized moon and we all went out there even godmamma for a few moments the men came out of the smoking-room windows and joined us and for the first time since i have been in france we talked to the persons we wanted to without either shouting across someone else or making a general conversation antoine and heloise leant over the balustrade the comte and the marquise stayed by the window while the vicomte whispered to me by the steps and victorine and her marquis stood like two wax figures not saying a word by the orange trees i don't know whether it was owing to the moon or not but the vicomte did say such a lot of charming things to me he said he loved me and would i marry him 
he would arrange it all as fortunately he has no parents to consult i seem to be getting quite used to proposals now because it did not excite me in the least but i don't think i want to marry any one yet mamma so i told him you would never let me marry a frenchman and he had better forget all about me he said as much about love as he could in the ten minutes we were left talking together and put it so nicely not a bit the violent want to eat one up way the marquis has i felt once or twice quite inclined to say yes if only it had been an affair of a week but unfortunately even in france you have to stay on with people longer than that and that's the part i would not have managed i made him understand at last that i really meant not to have him and he was very miserable but you can't tear your hair or cry with every one looking on and as it all had to be done in a voice as if one was talking about the weather he did not show much only he looked very white when we came into the lights again but he whispered as he said good-night that he did not despair he would always love me and when i married some one else his day would come which i did not think kind of him as i don't want to be a widow the marquis had not a chance to say a word to me he tried often but i avoided him he looked so out of temper i am sure it would have been something disagreeable he and the vicomte nearly came to blows going out of the door just over a silly thing like the vicomte's sword knocking against the marquis's boot i hope they won't really fight when they had all gone and we were going up to bed i thought jean looked as if his fit was coming on again so i bolted into my room and on the whole i am rather glad to be coming back to england on thursday to-day we go over to tournelle a visit of ceremony for me to say good-bye and they are all dear people there and i shall always hope to see them again now good-bye dear mamma with love from your affectionate daughter elizabeth p s i wish his hair wasn't cut on brosse but of course one couldn't marry a frenchman anyway chateau de coimard wednesday september seventh dearest mamma it was really quite sad saying good-bye to all the people at tournelle the baron almost wept over me and said that they would be dreadfully dull without me they all kissed me on both cheeks and even hippolyte as he put us into the carriage after i tipped him remarked mieux vaut épouser un français et rester toujours chez nous vous êtes trop belle demoiselle pour les brouillards d'angleterre i wonder after all if the marquis will ever marry victorine as it seems when he got back last night he was in such a temper that he made a scene with the baron and his mother he said that victorine made him look ridiculous that she was unappetizing without wit and ugly enough to have tranquillized saint anthony at his worst moment of temptation whatever that means i overheard the baron tell all this to eloise while the old baron was making me compliments in his fearful english the marquis stamped his foot and finally bursting into tears announced that he would go back to paris back to adele whoever she is and find consolation so off he started this morning the first thing oh, what a man mamma crying like a child his mother and the baron are very anxious about him as if he really decides to jeter la manche après la cognée who is to pay his debts the baron also said that if elizabeth that's me had only been married it would have been all a simple matter because then there would be no cause for him to despair and he would not have occupied himself about an ordinary subject like who they married him to in the meantime but as it is the contrast between us victorine and me whom he cannot obtain is too great and the sooner i am out of his sight the better it does sound all greek doesn't it to you mamma i repeat it just as the baron said it we went into the garden presently and the marquise and the comte and i walked together she had not got over the affair at dinner and did nothing but laugh and joke about it 
she said that victorine at all events will give the marquis no anxieties in the future but she is sure he will have to se griser to get through the wedding <laughs> fortunately victorine was not with us as godmamma was too tired to accompany her it would not have been proper for her to come with only her brother and sister-in-law as her fiance being supposed to be at tournelle she might have had private conversation with him not under godmamma's eye oh mustn't it be awful to be french eloise says it isn't so bad as this in the smart set in paris they speak to one another there quite a lot before getting married and do almost english things but godmamma is of the old school before we left the marquis turned up he looked thoroughly worn out and as piano as a beaten dog he was awfully polite to jean and eloise and hardly looked at me but as i did not want to leave with him still feeling cross with me i got the chance at last to tell him i hoped he would be happy and to congratulate him he bowed deeply and thanked me and then under his breath as he stooped to pick up a flower i had dropped he said vous avez brisé mon coeur et cela m'est égal ce qui arrive but i don't believe it mamma he has not got a heart to break he's only a silly doll and worthy of victorine i saw the baron talking to him seriously while we were having five o'clock and just as we were starting she came up and said low to eloise who was beside me j'espère que tout va bien adèle l'a remplacé et ne veut plus de lui oh la bonne fille so whoever adèle is i suppose she has done victorine a good turn i asked eloise on our way home if adèle was a relation of the marquise and she went into fits of laughter and said oh oui une très proche <laughs> but i can't see anything to laugh at can you mamma in the evening there was a ghastly dinner party at Quamar. three sets of provincial families oh they are really awful these entertainments and so different to english ones nobody bothers about even numbers you feel obliged to ask the x's the y's and the z's from duty and so you do it doesn't in the least matter if they are mostly females you have to ask the family because if the daughters are grown up they can't be left at home alone they would be getting into mischief this is the kind of assortment that arrives papa x mamma x and two girl x's papa y mamma y and master and miss y papa z mamma z aunt z and mamselle z such a party godmamma just revels in these frumps they make eloise furious and the airs of victorine her coyness and giggling nearly drove me wild i sat next to m y and although he is a baron of very old family he ate like a pig the food was extraordinarily good but the proof of good service here is to get the whole dinner of i don't know how many courses over under the hour so one has no sooner swallowed a mouthful when one's plate is snatched away and one begins to devour something else but with this awful man gobbling at my side and those foolish girls giggling beyond even the forty minutes seemed ages afterwards in the salon the jeune fille was sent to talk at the other side of the room supervised by the tug who did not dine but was in waiting oh if you had heard their conversation mamma it was worse than the day the two came to breakfast just one endless string of questions to victorine about the marquis with giggles over the possibilities of their own fiancée it is so extraordinary that they can ever turn into witty fascinating women like eloise and the marquise of course these are just provincial nobodies whom eloise would not dream of knowing in paris perhaps the girls there are better victorine told them the marquis was beau comme l'archange michel and had for her une brûlante dévotion oh what will she say if after all he refuses to come to the scratch jean is to accompany agnes and me up to paris to-morrow to see us safely off to dieppe i hope he won't have another fit in the train 
i shall tell agnes to take plenty of salts and brandy in her bag and a bottle of soda water because i have always heard that a sudden shock is best for people in fits and one could pop the soda water over him if the worst came to the worst now good night dear mamma your affectionate daughter elizabeth p s an awful wind is blowing i hope i shan't be drowned crossing the channel e chateau de croixmar thursday night oh, dearest mamma i hope you got the telegram all right to-day saying i would not leave the storm became really so fearful they would not hear of my starting and as it turned out i am very glad for to-night we dined at tournelle to celebrate the baron's birthday and we had such an amusing time all the usual lot were there as well as those two officers who came to the foire with us and about three or four more people from paris so we were quite a large party everybody gave the baronne a present and such baskets of flowers as she had in the salon assez pour tourner la tête as hippolyte said the baronne was dressed in pale mauve and looked lovely only such a funny thing happened at dinner the vicomte who sat next to her made her laugh dreadfully just as she was eating her soup and she choked and suddenly one cheek quite fell in while the other stuck out as if a potato was in it one could not think what had happened but it appears that she wears plumpers of a kind of red gutta percha to keep her face nice and round and in choking the right cheek's one got jerked across into the left cheek and that is how she got that toothachy look oh mustn't it be a bother mamma to have to do all that but the baron is such a dear that one did not even laugh the marquis had to sit by victorine and i saw him looking at the pink rosebuds in her hair with a cautious eye and he sat up as straight as anything in case she should get caught in him again but it is all right he means to go through with it the baron told heloise directly we got there so i thought as it was finally settled there would be no harm in talking to him a little he looked at me at dinner i smiled and it was so quaint mamma his whole face seemed to flush until his forehead was even pink with the veins showing at the side he lifted his champagne glass and kissed the edge of it and bowed to me and no one saw but the comte and he went into a chuckle of laughter as he whispered to me that if victorine had seen she would certainly tear my eyes out on the way home afterwards in the salon the vicomte managed to stand behind me while i was talking to the old baron and he said in a low voice why had i come back he was at peace waiting till his day came and here i had upset everything and he should have to go through endless more restless nights i said i was sorry the storm had prevented my starting especially as i was unwelcome so he threw prudence to the winds and said out loud before the baron that i knew it was not that and he looked so devoted and distressed that the dear old baron patted him on the back and turning away said oh mon brave gaston moi aussi j'étais jeune une fois and he left us alone by the window while he stood a sort of sentry in front the vicomte did whisper a lot of things he said just for one evening i might make him happy and pretend i loved him and let him call me chari so i said all right i didn't think it could matter as i'm coming home to-morrow mamma and shall probably never see him again and you said one ought always to be kind-hearted and do little things for people when i said all right his forehead got pink and the veins showed just like the marquise had done at dinner and he said oh chérie ma chérie ma bien aimée in such a voice it made me feel quite as if i wanted to listen some more only unfortunately at that moment godmamma came up she brushed the baron aside and said i should certainly catch cold by the window and must come with her while she annihilated the vicomte with a look there i was taken off to a sofa at the other side of the room and stuffed down between godmamma and the marquis's mother you can think i was cross 
however i'd paid her out for i just looked at the marquis who was seated by his victorine almost silent and like a dummy they are allowed to talk together now as long as they are not alone in the room it made him fidget so he could not attend to what she was saying and when finally he got up and came over to us and said had i seen the new natier the comte had just bought which was in the other salon and would i come and look at it i think godmamma wished she had left me safe with the vicomte she could not say anything as half the party had already gone to look at the picture so i got up at once and went with him his mother is years older than the baron and not a bit gay like her i saw them her and godmamma nodding their heads anxiously as we left no doubt they were deploring the bad bringing up of the english the marquis said it was awful what he was going through and when the dancing began presently would i give him the first boss i said certainly and by that time we were in the other salon and beside the marquise she smiled her dear little smile which always seems to mock at everything and put her tongue into her gap and whispered quelle comédie c'est bien petit espiègle amusez-vous and so i did i can't tell you what fun it was mamma i was in wild spirits and the marquis answered back and we were as gay as larks until i overheard the marquis's mother who had followed us say to him in an acid voice that he seemed to have forgotten that it was arranged for him to give victorine the engagement ring that evening and say a few appropriate words to her and he must take her to see the flowers in the conservatory and get it over there so off he had to go looking black and peevish and supervised by the two mothers who stood at the risk of catching their deaths of cold by the door he and victorine went arm in arm into the conservatory and disappeared behind some pots of palms it appears madame de vermandoise and the comte were in there too and saw what happened and she told eloise and me afterwards the fiancés came and stood quite close to them with only a bank of flowers between and they said the palms were pretty and were growing very tall and the marquis coughed and victorine began scrabbling with her toes on the marble floor in that irritating way she has and they neither of them spoke at last the marquis dashed at it and said as she already knew their parents had arranged they should marry and he hoped he would make her very happy at that moment the piano struck up very loud in the salon and prevented victorine from quite catching what he said he got very red and repeated it again but he mumbled so she still was not sure and had to say pardon for the second time that upset the marquis to such a point that he said damn which is the only english word he knows and when victorine looked horribly surprised he dived into his waistcoat pocket and fished out the ring then he took her hand pulled off her glove backward and pushed it on to the first finger he came to which happened to be the middle one he just said he hoped she would wear it for his sake and when she exclaimed mais monsieur ce n'est pas sur ce doigt que vous devez mettre la bague he hardly waited to apologize or put it right before he dragged her back to the salon and deposited her with the anxious mothers madame de vermandoise said she and the comte nearly had a fit to keep themselves from laughing out loud wasn't it too comic mamma how i should hate to be betrothed like that however victorine seems to think half a loaf is better than no bread for she kept her glove off all the rest of the evening and looked at her ring with conscious pride it is a very nice one a ruby and a pearl heart connected by a diamond marquise coronet they ought to have added a money-bag representing the dough and then the symbol would have been complete we had begun to dance when they got back and as the marquis had not been there to claim me i was valsing with jean the baronne kept the vicomte close to her side all the rest of the evening she told me as she kissed me in saying good-bye that she had done it for peace sake as she knew he and the marquis would have had a quarrel otherwise they were both so madly in love with me petite embrouillante famille va 
she said, mais je t'aime bien quand même. She is a darling, the baron. The marquis stood there glowering and never offered to dance with Victorine. She must have been cross. We had another farewell all round when the valse was over. Godmamma would not stay for another, and even Antoine seemed sorry to say adieu. Dépêchez-vous de vous marier, he said, et ensuite revenez auprès de nous. J'ai envie de vous faire la cœur, mais vous êtes beaucoup trop dangereuse pour le moment. Ça, c'est vrai, said the Comte and Jean together, and everyone laughed. Now that the betrothal ring is really on Victorine's finger, and Héloise knows she will be got off, she doesn't mind a bit about the Marquis looking at me. She kept laughing to herself over it all the way home. She really detests Victorine. Godmamma and the bride-elect hardly spoke a word, and I am sure if a perfect hurricane blows tomorrow, they won't suggest my waiting another day, so I shall be glad to be off. Good night, dear Mamma. You will see me almost as soon as you get this, as I shall only sleep the night in London at Aunt Mary's. With love from your affectionate daughter, Elizabeth. End of section 13